So one big question we have is just how does this whole idea of enlightenment um, get so popular, right? Why has it become such a big deal? And really a lot of it comes down to the salons. Now the salons are not where you got your hair done. Um, salons are uh, where in cities the uh, you know the rich, the powerful, the uh, writers of the time would sit and talk. And uh, one of my college friends always told how um, the Enlightenment was built on coffee. Weird story, right? Well, they were doing these salons. They would uh, meet in these rooms with other philosophers, other uh, thinkers, all that kind of stuff. People are interested in these topics. They would come together. They would sit. They would drink coffee and tea, eat food and talk. And that would be about it. And so in a way, coffee is why we have these. So here's an example of, of a Parisian salon. Um, all the major cities had these salons, right, where you would go and you would meet and you would talk. Um, here's the most famous one by far is Madame Geoffrey's salon. Uh, she was one of the ones that had the leading ones. Uh, she was visited by Rousseau and Voltaire. Um, you know, the big names of the Renaissance hung out at, Ma at Madame Geoffrey's. Um, obviously, the biggest one being Madame Geoffrey, who was one of the biggest uh, salon uh, runners. Um, Madame Suzanne Necker as well in, in uh, Paris. Um, um, it was also Julie La La Panasse. Um the saloniers, uh, typically the salons were run by women. They weren't run by men, but instead run by women. Uh, women run the salons. They get a chance to interact in the salons a little bit with the men. Um, and it wasn't with these women. These people wouldn't really talk, wouldn't meet, wouldn't discuss, uh, would not, you know, talk about these topics that prior to this really had never really been talked about. And so we kind of think that we have this. Um, in Berlin, uh, it was Jewish women that made the salons. So there are, there are salons in Berlin. Uh, in Warsaw, there are salons. Uh, London, a lot of middle class women did that. And they actually used money to publish writings by people like Mary Wollstonecraft uh, to make uh, their salons happen. So, uh, you know, kind of these, these salons, right, kind of the women's role in this was, was running the salons and being part of that. And by, the, by them running the salons, they got to uh, help explain and help interact within the uh, whole uh, enlightenment process as well. Uh, there were even a few female philosophers that were out there. Um, Emily du Chalet was a French, French, French old woman who was the mistress of Voltaire. Um, so we talked about her during the scientific revolution where, you know, she would work on math. She was a math genius, right? Essentially, she took all of uh, the writings of, uh, of Leibniz and Gott, of, uh, Gottfried Leibniz and Isaac Newton, all this physics, math and stuff, and essentially... Explain it to regular people what she was able to do. Um, Voltaire, who was you know the great writer we talked about earlier in our previous podcast, um, we were reading, reading some of his stuff in class, uh, was his girlfriend slash lover type person, and honestly, she taught him science because he couldn't get it, um, and she'd have published so typically you know work at night and publish you know, and honestly because of, of her of being a female. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft, one of my favorite. Uh, example of female philosopher at time. She's an English woman. Um, you know, she grew up in a house where she had a very violent upbringing. She had a father who was a violent drunk who lost all the family money. Um, she had to kind of act a, as many women did this time as a mother to her sisters. But uh, instead of getting married right away, she kind of broke tradition and traveled with her friends, her female friends, and traveled with um, her sisters and eventually became a writer uh, where she wrote a lot about uh, topics of education, her travels, and those kind of things. Um, you know, eventually she was picked up by John Joseph, who was a very liberal publisher, and she published some of her books. Um, she didn't visit France during the, during the Revolution. Uh, she actually arrived about a month, I guess, before uh, Louis, the, Louis the 16th had his head chopped off. Um, and eventually, when Britain and France go to war, she has to kind of hide out. She actually uh, ends up falling in love with an American named Gilbert Imlay, where she has a child out of wedlock, um, and eventually does have to leave France. But uh, she has a very interesting history in terms of, you know, she attempts suicide after Emily leaves her. Uh, she travels through Scandinavia, trying to get Emily back, uh, and writes all these books and stuff. Then she was getting married to William Godwin, who is a who's, a, who's another uh, uh, philosophic, philosophical writer in, in England as well. But her most famous piece is uh, Vindication of Rights of Women, essentially arguing that, hey, women are just equal as men, but they have not had the equal access to education. So if they had equal access to education, they would be just as good at everything uh, as men are. Um, she would die at age 38 uh, after uh, childbirth. She had an infection and, and passed away, but another great example. We'll, we'll come back to her again, too, when we look at the at the um, uh, French Revolution as well. Um, another way we spread these ideas out is through a man named Dennis Diderot. Uh, Diderot uh, is the founder and creator of the encyclopedia, is what he basically did. Um, 
And he essentially said, you know, all things were examined, debated without regard for feelings. So you can't get emotionally attached to topics. Top it off, too, he says, you know, um, he also said we don't like we don't like dumb laws, essentially, right? Uh, you must begin census laws until they're reformed, um, but we'll abide by them in the meantime. So what he creates is the encyclopedia, uh, a way to share all these information, right? Because it's a one a one stop shop, if you will, to take all these writings from philosophers and other and scientists and all that kind of stuff and share it out with everybody is what he's trying to do. Um, and so this was twenty eight volumes of material, right? to be knowledge on everything. It wasn't just like encyclopedia stuff, okay? There was science, there was building, there was uh, philosophical writings in it, there were ads, all kinds of stuff was in there, okay? Published its first ever set in 1751. It cost 1,500 livres a set, which was more than most people made in a year. But the idea is to share these new ideas and make a one-stop shop that people can visit and engage with all this new material. Um, What's really cool about these documents, there's some pictures here. This is what the encyclopedia had it. It had everything from figures and drawings, how to make stuff, how to do stuff, how to create things. Um, it had anatomy, physiology. You could look at it for shipbuilding, mining, uh, smelting, making a chair. I mean, everything was in here. And I actually got to uh, look at an original first edition encyclopedia at Carlton College. I was there for a conference, and you had to wear the little, little white gloves and stuff and pay to it. It is just so cool. The detailed drawings they had, um, but it's a chance to share that information with people and give a one-stop shop, one place where people look and find information. I love how they shared out the ideas of anatomy and all the things we've learned so far about anatomy and sharing one place in Diderot's encyclopedia. So you can see subscriptions to encyclopedias of where they were. Notice what you said, this is a very much an urban type movement, right? And notice France has tons of these, right? Where some cities have over a hundred uh, in subscriptions to the encyclopedia. Uh, less over here in East, you know, Eastern Europe. Uh, France is where it's mostly is, a little bit in London, Spain a few, but not many. But really France is this big movement where encyclopedia is a big thing. Um, We'll call it the Republic of Letters, the idea of sharing letters, all that kind of stuff to it. So three that level of this. The urban part of this is how the elites, these philosophers, these rich people gather in salons, start talking about stuff. And that's where that urban part of this whole thing came from. The urbane part is kind of that cosmopolitan city-based movement where you can share access to all this different stuff, right? You have access to music and art and literature. You can share the world and see the world. You can read newspapers, latest books, all that kind of stuff from around the planet. And uh, at least plant they knew. Um, and get access to all those things through publishing, through encyclopedia, all that. Also, politeness that you, it was a certain way you behaved. You had to behave a certain way, act a certain way. There were certain rules of behavior you had to follow. And everyone was kind of self governed with that. And they made sure they followed the rules and that they called those out who didn't. Um, the cool part about this is that literacy increases a lot. Okay, Our literacy rates, 80% for men, 60% for women, much higher than they were before this. Um, Books are pricey, okay? Even with printing, a book may be a whole day's wage. What's really cool is that a lot of people shared that one book. Um, if you live somewhere, you would share books with your neighbors, your family, uh, so you read all this different stuff. But the coolest thing is that there's such a, a bigger variety of things that get made, um, books that are being published. You have very, very early novels being published, um, different plays and literatures being created. You can read the memoirs of people. So they print memoirs of philosophers, memoirs of rulers. You get to listen to their private lives and see what they're all about. Um, there are books on philosophy. There are hist creation of history, like how we had that um, book on the uh, decline fall of the Roman Empire, history of France. They write books about Louis XIV. All those kind of things happen with this. Um, and newspapers explode, right? Sharing news from newspapers, through political pamphlets that you write about, like, uh, like John Locke wrote. Uh, all those kind of things end up getting shared. Uh, which is really, really cool because people start reading a lot, a lot more. Um, you know, a little sketch here, you can see people in a library, probably a private library, you know, reading, sharing books. Um, and it's kind of cool to see how much it's increased. I mean, obviously, the urban literacy in France doesn't have to go up a lot in 100 years, but still, it's still 9% of people. Um, you know, the German states goes from 3 to 4% literacy rate to almost half, if not higher. Um, Rural Normandy, so it's going to be in rural France, goes up a lot from, you know, next to nothing to almost 75% for males.
it's huge in terms of literacy. Here are your must-read books the time, hint, 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 you read mostly is things like Isaac Newton and Locke, uh, Locke, 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 uh, Voltaire and Montesquieu and Rousseau, the Encyclopedia, Condorcet. Um, these are the must-read books of the time, these ideas that were being thrown around. We're going to talk about those ideas a lot next week. Um, enjoy your weekend. Try to catch up so we can uh, take care of business. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it.